Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure, and uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to speak uh, if I can share my screen about um, the brain tumor in children and all all we do to differentiate the um, the brain tumor, especially in the posterior fossa, but not only in the omics era, because as you know, there is all. Uh, um, a different classification in tumors uh, based on molecular profile, not only histology. So basically, I'm a bit late. Uh, uh, we are a bit late, but uh, you, you interrupt me if there is no time. But basically, in 2016, as you know, there was this new classification of tumor based on combination between histology and molecular profile. And what we uh, realized, this is a, the group uh, uh, from Toronto, is that uh, imaging is now expected to uh, do uh, the differential diagnosis also based on subtype, meaning that we can help the, you as neurosurgeons and the pathology in interpreting the biology of the tumor before the complex uh, um, methylation analysis and, and so on. And this can guide also the decision making during the operation. So what I would like to show you uh, in the in the next uh, 25 minutes is how we, so which kind of uh, uh, radiological techniques and, and radiological uh, findings we use to do a different uh, di uh, differential diagnosis between the subtype, genetic subtypes of tumors and why we do that. So what is the embryological reason for the radiological appearances of some tumors? So we we'll start with the, uh, the, the big category of uh, is, um, exquisitely present in pediatric population that is cerebellar. So there are embryonal tumor, not only cerebellar, that's uh, from the web, but basically embryonal tumor are medulloblastoma, uh, embryonal tumor with multilayer rosette that involved the uh, etanter uh, and the, um, before called uh, PNET and the ATRT, right? So this big uh, category of embryonal tumors, they have one histological characteristic in common that are all small round blue cells packed together. And this means that all these tumors will be hyper dense on CT and they will have striking hyper intensity in DWI with uh, uh, reduction of the ADC value. So the first thing, uh, the first message is that after years working at Toronto and Gosh, uh, we realized that the main sequence that we have are not perfusion, spectroscopy or advanced uh, DTI technique. The main sequence is diffusion to start the differential diagnosis. So all the embryonal tumor will have a relatively homogeneous diffusion restriction. And also CT, why it's so important? Because uh, you know, I, 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 I saw before there was this paper on, on patient from Ghana. I am myself involved in some studies with Nigeria uh, and a colleague sending me uh, cases from Kenya. Sometimes they do not have an MRI available but the CT also show this density in the embryonal tumor uh, that is very similar to the density of the cerebellar cortex where all these cells are packed together. So we can use even the CT. We don't need the ADC sometimes, that of course is the, the gold standard, but you can see how dark is this medulloblastoma on ADC. And remember, medulloblastoma can enhance or not, can have variable signal in T2, Sometimes when they do not enhance, and I don't have time to show, I have a lot of examples of tumors that enhance a diagnosis, and then the metastasis do not enhance, and we pick up only using the diffusion. So remember, trust diffusion first, and when you see something restricting, you think embryonal tumor. Of course, this is a medulloblastoma, it's the most common among the embryonal tumor, but I will show you how to differentiate between the groups of medulloblastoma that I showed you before, that are four groups. And why this is important to differentiate? This is a paper from Taylor, again from Toronto, back in 2012, almost 10 years now. But look at these four groups here. As you know, these groups have uh, differences in demographic, histology, in the sense that all of them can be classic or large um, anaplastic, but only the sonic edge can have a desmoplastic nodular histotype. But most importantly, the prognosis 
changes because W and T, they are very good prognosis, almost the same as a pilocytic astrocytoma, completely different from a group three. So it is important to understand that what look, so they are called medulloblastoma because historically on microscope, they look all the same. But when the molecular profile comes into the picture, you have completely different behavior and a completely different prognosis and potentially different treatment and management. For example, if you have a WNT, some of our surgeons, they consider, well, maybe we will not go so aggressively toward the brainstem because we know that this tumor has a better prognosis. How to distinguish them? Each of them, uh, they have different embryological origin. We can use that on images. Let me show you. So this is uh, um, um, the embryological cerebellar development. So you have a Purkinje cell here and external granular cells here. So we know, of course, that Purkinje cells are normally in the surface of the cerebellum, but during the embryological development, the precursor of the granular cell are externally. And then what happens normally, you have sonic hedgehog stimulation and they go, they proliferate and they migrate internally in comparison to the Purkinje cell. So normally we have, when a, when a child is born, Purkinje cell externally and granular layer internally. What happens if something goes wrong here is that you have a tumorigenesis, but also this proliferation, this migration is blocked. And why this is so important for our radiologists to know the biology of the sonic edge of medulloblastoma because the tumors will be stuck in the surface of the cerebellum. And so you will have a restricted tumor because this is an embryonal tumor, almost looking extra axial. Look at this. It looks extra axial. It's actually in the hemispheric, uh, in the, in the uh, right hemisphere, but it's so peripheral because it starts from the, this uh, granular cells uh, it originates from the granular cells that it looks exactly like that. So when you see something like that, uh, you can, uh, you know, and this is the appearance on contest, but you can just say this is a sonic edgehog with the intermediate prognosis in comparison to group between group three and four and the group, the WNT. So you see the location and you have the diagnosis once, of course, you confirm the restriction. That is the first step. Um, and then... Uh, so I have a bit of background noise, I don't know, um, but yeah. Um, anyway, and the second the second group is the wingless uh, medulloblastoma, so WNT, which is very rare and older children. So you use also the age of the child, seven, eight, and so on. But these tumors are not tumor from the granular cell of the cerebellum. Actually, they are not even from the cerebellum, but they derive from the, uh, from the brainstem. And what, Embryological, again, the embryology helps a lot in the differential. What they do, they start from, from here, from the fourth ventricle, and they go down and laterally here in the CP angle, foramen of Lushka, and they reach the brainstem because they are embryonal precursor of brainstem. And what does it mean? That we have tumors that can develop all along this pathway. So they will be in the, um, they can be, in the foramen of Lushka and Ponto cerebellar angle. So if you have something restricting in this location, think of, especially if the child is seven, eight, so it's not very, very young, think WNT, very good prognosis. So this is very important, but of course, most of the WNT develop from here and will be indistinguishable, but at least you have an extra tool for the differential diagnosis, very, very important. Finally, the group three and four, they are, you know, the, the genetic base is still unknown. They, 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 are, they are studying still, but they have a poor prognosis. So look for metastatic dissemination act diagnosis. And sometimes the group four does not enhance. So this is the typical midline four ventricle, the so-called typical medulloblastoma. And I will know that it's not typical. We just know that this is group three or four. If enhances group three, very poor prognosis. If it does not enhance, think more a group four. But irrespectively from the enhancement, they will restrict. And the group four, no enhancement, fine, but the metastasis will show restriction. So look for the restriction for the metastasis. And if you 
have a scan from another center, maybe it's not a neuroradiologist and so on, you can look on your diffusion for small metastatic disease that will be dark in ADC and hyperintensity in DWI. This is very important for the management of the patient. And look, this is a case that we published uh, in pediatric radiology in 2018. And this is a group four, not enhancing. Uh, and uh, it gave leptomeningeal dissemination. In this case, there was enhancement in the leptomeningeal dissemination, but sometimes you have non-enhancing nodules in the ventricles, for instance, typical location. So just to recap, um, is uh, location, location, location is very important. Uh, w and T can be in the pontus cerebellar ringle for amyl oblushka and have good prognosis because they are brain stem cells. Uh, sonic hedgehog, peripheral location, intermediate prognosis. Group three and four, poor midline, they can enhance group three, they do not enhance group four. Poor prognosis, unknown, I mean, they, they know something about molecular profile and genetic, but not as much as uh, um, WNT and sonic hedgehog, uh, as far as I know, my knowledge no, uh, goes. Um, all of them will show diffusion restriction. Sometimes we cannot predict molecular subtime. Why? When? When the, the tumor is midline. Because if we, this is a WNT looking exactly like a group three. Why is that? Because I showed you this pathway during the embryological development. What is the tumorigenesis starts when the, the, the cells are there? They will look exactly like group three and four. The same for sonic hedgehog. Sonic hedgehog starts from the granular peripheral cells of the cerebellum. But what if we start from the vermis here? So in, when you have a midline restricted tumor in a child, you cannot be 100% sure, although statistically it will be most likely group three or group four. But remember that this can be also WNT and sonic edge. So when it's midline, we cannot, we just can say this is a medulloblastoma. But when you have the other location, peripheral location for sonic edge and CP angle for WNT, in all ch children, you can actually say, well, this has to be a WNT um, medullo. There's one another, another important thing I will show you in a bit, the ATRT in the posterior fossa also have the prevalence for the CP angle, but the age range completely different. So these are children, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years old, ATRT will be not older than three years old. Very, very, very important difference. So sometimes you use the location and the restriction, but then you consider the age. ATRT, very bad prognosis. WNT, medulloblastoma, very good prognosis. Speaking about ATRT, again, diffusion restriction, but the age is super important. And remember, they have the, in the posterior fossa, they, they can be everywhere, but in the posterior fossa, they have the, uh, the, uh, also, they, they like the, the uh, pontus cerebellar angle location. And sometimes if you have a nodule of restriction along the third nerve, cranial nerves, this is also typical of ATRT in this age range. It will be extremely rare to have a schwannoma in this age range. And now there are subgroups, uh, molecular subgroups, also for ATRT. Uh, they are less important than medulloblastoma because they do not impact the prognosis. But still, we can... Uh, really find some differences in them. For instance, the ATRT tyrosine activated will be uh, a lot of the time in the posterior fossa, and most of them will have this peripheral cyst. So if you have something in a very young child in the posterior fossa, again, look, this is a, a two years old male in the pontus cerebellar angle slash foramen of Lushka with peripheral cyst. This is an ATRT, most likely. And uh, uh, this is most likely an ATRT tyrosine activated, but this is a bit uh, like, uh, you know, it's, it's not very useful for you guys to, to like for the medulloblastoma because this is a bad prognosis, but it's good to know that it's an ATRT, but this tyrosine activated rather than sonic age or activated at this point, they don't have yet specific drugs. So it's not so important, but it's important to know that you can to this diagnosis and you don't think that this is an uh, ependymoma for instance, an aplastic ependymoma for instance. The third embryonal tumor is the embryonal tumor with multilayer Euroset. They do not enhance most of the time. Look, this is very poor enhancement. If you see something like that in, a, in an adult, you may think this is an oligodendroglioma, but they will have restriction, 
very minimum and um, edema. These are the characteristics from Novak. Uh, a lot of restriction, all of them restricts, very minimal edema. And uh, uh, they have enhancement, but it's uh, just a partial. Most of the mass does not enhance. And they have, again, molecular characterization that is C90MC altered mutation. So again, it's more than the histology, is the molecular uh, um, um, profile that characterized the diagnosis. And I will show you something that was very educative for us. Look at this case. This is a peripheral lesion with a bit of tail here, okay? Uh, flare, nothing, but look at the diffusion restriction. Enhancement, no enhancement whatsoever. Look at DWI, look at ADC. This is a very restricting lesion, non-enhancing, so cannot be a pilocytic or a ganglioglioma. But I mean, I thought when I saw that, that this was uh, you know, a focal cortical dysplasia, but then look at the restriction. And this cannot be a focal cortical dysplasia. This was an embryonal tumor with multilayer groset. You cannot wait on this because the child didn't have seizures. You need to go there, operate, uh, plan chemotherapy, aggressive, uh, uh, aggressive management. So my, my pearl is trust diffusion first. No matter what, it's very rare to have a pilocytic or a ganglioglioma that restricts. And the other tumor of the non-embryonal tumor, the posterior fossa in particular, they are called the good, the bad, and the ugly. I like the movie. Um, pilocytic astrocytoma, look, midline, enhancing, a bit of cyst. What's the difference from the other? No diffusion restriction. Look how dark is in DWI, how uh, hyper intense uh, or with high values in ADC. So this is... Uh, the important thing. Why so important? Because if you use advanced techniques in pilocytic, like spectroscopy, this is a pilocytic. In spectroscopy, look like an adult uh, glioblastoma multiformis, uh, GBM. So this is misleading. Perfusion is misleading. You see something like that in an adult, you think this is a tumor that is uh, uh, going toward uh, anaplastic. But uh, because of the leaking vessel that they have, perfusion can be misleading in pilocytic astrocytoma. Trust diffusion first. In pilocytic, you need to do uh, post-contrast, of course, uh, at least at the diagnosis, and because 10% can show dissemination. To the best of my knowledge, never in the posterior fossa, but the optipathway gliomas, they, they can metastatize. And they can be everywhere, but the brainstem lo uh, um, localization is very, very important for your differential diagnosis. Why? Because if they are in this location, so midbrain, posterior pons, and medulla oblongata, again, not restricting, they are very, very good. If they are in the anterior pons, not restricting, very benign radiological appearance, this has to be a DIPG, 90% of the cases, very bad prognosis. So this is the bad but the rest is very, very good. And again, look, not no, cystic appearance, solid cystic appearance, no restriction. Diffuse midline glioma, we, we used to call it diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, but now we know, again, there is a molecular profile that is uh, histone 3 k 27 mutation, uh, and they can be everywhere, but mainly in the pons. Anterior pons, encasing of the basilar artery, you all are familiar, with these appearances. But what I want to show you is that the radiological appearance of this tumor is very benign. Look here, the perfusion is higher in the spared part of the pons. So remember, no the hyperdensity, most of the time, no enhancement, although some of them can enhance. This will not show diffusion restriction. Sometimes they look like that, enhancing, very aggressive, bad spectroscopy. The prognosis between this one and the benign looking exactly the same and is exactly uh, and is very very bad. So in this case, in the brainstem, we use location, location, location. Something in the anterior pons needs to be considered diffuse midline glioma until otherwise proven. Very important. Look at this other lesion, though. This is two-year female, uh, old female, so very, very young for the IPG, with this lesion in the anterior pond, no enhancing, no perfusion. Look at the restriction. This is unexpected in absence of enhancement, especially for a pontine 
diffuse uh, uh, the IPG for the um, uh, pontine diffuse midline glioma. So what is that? At this age, diffusion, so striking homogeneous diffusion, this was another embryonal tumor with multilayered rosette. So again, even in the brainstem, trust diffusion first. Either you have something that does not restrict, or you have something like in this case, which can have a bit of restriction, but a lot of enhancement. But if you have homogeneous restriction, no enhancement, no edema, rarely we had at least two or three cases of uh, ETMR in the ponds. The, the, the management is different in these cases. Remember, diffuse spontane glioma can be supratentorial or in the spine. So it's just a molecular diagnosis. So now the focus is not supra infratentorial anymore for this tumor. It's midline when they have the K27M mutation and off midline, they have other histone mutation like G34R, and this will be included in the new classification probably uh, that is coming out this uh, summer, if I'm not mistaken, of the, uh, of the brain tumor. So very, very important that the diffuse midline glioma can be also here. Do not call this pilocytic just straight away. Consider diffuse midline glioma, consider a, a biopsy. I try to give some uh, like neurosurgical points of interest. But in this case, you, you need to do a biopsy because the, the, the approach will be different. And they can have uh, all the kind of histology. These are two GBM, but different mutations. So this is a G34 and off midline. K27, so this is diffuse midline glioma in the thalamus. Both are GBM in terms of histology, but what makes the difference, at least in terms of future therapy, is the histone uh, um, and the molecular profile. Uh, just finally, the ependymoma. Everyone knows, I call it the ugly, because they can have mixed uh, ADC values, uh, but the enhancement is very heterogeneous, and there is... Uh, uh, calcium here, they go, this plastic appearance along the foramen of Lushka. Sometimes I have problem in differentiating like this case. This was an aplastic ependymoma uh, with a lot of restriction. There was a lot of heterogeneity, but we were in doubt, is this an ependymoma or a meduloblastoma? Sometimes it can be tricky when they are completely midline, but this is the only tricky differential that I found, to be honest. Remember that we have ependymoma supratentorial, Rela fusion, looking very aggressive. Uh, this is an ependymoma, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. You see how many in the uh, spine, posterior fossa, supratentorial. Uh, just I want to stress the posterior fossa. So now there is again a molecular classification of the ependymoma in the posterior fossa, group A and group B. They look exactly the same on microscope, exactly the same. Like, like this, just the group A is very bad. The group B, similar to pilocytic astrocytoma. So things that before we look at the microscope and we, we classify the same, now we know they are different and they have very good or bad prognosis depending on the molecular profile. What do you use? Yeah, the group A is very young. So it's not teenagers, young, younger children. They have more lateral location and they have metastasis and they die often. In comparison with group B, that is the adult teenager um, ependymoma. So we use the age more. And this is also a bit of radiology you can use. Look, the lateral location typical of the group A with the brainstem displaced, while the group B or the child with infiltration of the obex midline uh, rather than, than on, on the side. But I use the age first, to be fair. But the prognosis, look at that, completely different. So things they look exactly the same on microscope, they have very, very different prognosis. And this is what we publish. And I wanted to ask you, you know, this is something that uh, we publish a slightly different uh, uh, flowchart. This is an evolution uh, that we use for the differential diagnosis with Cesar Alves, uh, who is um, a new radiologist at Children's Hospital Philadelphia. Um, and we are recruiting uh, more and more patient uh, to 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 further validate this uh, this uh, this flowchart. So if you want, uh, if you have patient, just send me an email. I'm very very happy uh, to put you in contact with Cesar. Uh, and just a couple of tips: uh, we don't use glyomatosis cerebri anymore in the histological molecular classification, but we still use as the descriptive terms for supratentorial tumor when the you know there are these infiltrative tumors, especially older children. 
And then trust diffusion first, use location, and then add the age of the patient. And most of the time you will be right before the, 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 the biopsy and the molecular analysis. Uh, this is the people I would like to, to, to thank. And this is, um, I'm from Amalfi Coast, uh, from the south of Italy. So if you, you know, want to visit, I mean, I know Greece is so beautiful. Normally I do this lecture in UK, they have not very beautiful places, but just to promote a bit the place I'm from as well. And if you have any, um, any question, I'm very happy to take them. Any questions for Dr. Darko? Can I start first? Hi, Vasilis. Of course, Vasilis. Thanks, Felicia. That was amazing, really. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I have about a million questions. So I will come down only to one. I saw that you have diagnosis for some of the lesion, uh, pontine lesions. Does that mean that our colleagues at GOES, do they routinely biopsy these lesions? So... Uh, it depends. Uh, sometimes it looks uh, clinically and age-wise very, very typical. And so they do not biopsy. But the tendency now is, if you can, to biopsy, especially if there is something off about the clinical presentation and it's very long-standing clinical presentation. We had a case, I call it the DIPG. Another colleague say, no, it has to be more benign. And the clinical presentation was more benign. So they biopsy and came out as a DIPG because of location. But of course, uh, uh, there is a, a, a new paper about the molecular landscape, a pilot study, I can send it to you, of DIPG. And there are new molecular things, molecular profile. And I think it's very important, uh, if possible, to, uh, to have this molecular information. Of course, uh, in the, you know, if you need to act fast and you, you know, you, it's just a typical DIPG, you don't biopsy, but there is always an MDT discussion. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes they, bio, they do biopsy the, 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 the thalamic uh, lesion or because they, they often come out as DIPG, not pilocytic. And in this case, the contrast can help you because a, a pilocytic will enhance and a dia also bad enhancement, like a GBM kind of enhancement, but it's still benign. A DMG in the thalamus will not enhance, uh, but in this case, you need to be sure. So we do we do uh, do a lot of biopsy. Also, the optic pathway now sometimes biopsy to see the molecular profile because there are therapies that goes one way or another. Yeah. Thank you. Many thanks, Felicia. Um, I also wanted to say if you have you know, trainees and fellow that are interested in neuroimages. I, you know, I put all my lecture on YouTube and other colleagues put there so they can just check. And there are also other colleagues in GOSH that have other YouTube channels. So, I mean, it's good, you know, we share these things because otherwise we record and it's a pity that um, yeah. we do so many cases. That's, that's great. Congratulations, Felicia. Thank you very much once more, Dr. Darko for your participation, for your contribution to our session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ε, καλησπέρα Thank you. και από μένα. Συγχαρητήρια σε όλους τους ομιλητές και σε αυτούς που πρωτοστάτησαν στη διοργάνωση της Διεμερίδας. Ε, θα ήθελα να κάνω ένα σχολιασμό σε σχέση με τη συζήτηση που έγινε ε, με την ομιλία της κυρίας Βιολάκη, της εντατικολόγου και της ερώτησης που έκανε ο Νίκος Αφόρογλου. Ε, καταρχήν, να πω συγχαρητήρια στην κυρία Βιολάκη για την παρουσίαση, που μας έφερε πιο κοντά στα προβλήματα που αντιμετωπίζουν στις μονάδες συντατικής των παιδών. Ε, και συμφωνώ με αυτό που είπε, ότι μπορεί να υπάρχει κάποια στιγμή υπερβολική αισιοδοξία από τους νευροχειρουργούς για το πόσο νωρί μπορεί να ξυπνήσει ο ασθενής. Ε, πιστεύω όμως ότι παρόλο αυτό και παρόλες τις ακρότητες που μπορεί να υπάρχουν ε, στην αντιμετώπιση ορισμένες φορές, είτε από υπεραισιοδοξία, είτε από κακή εκτίμηση των δυσκολιών κλπ. Ε, είναι λάθος η εκτίμηση ότι ό,τι ακουμπάει ο νευροχειρουργός κανίδημα. Πρώτον, γιατί πάρα πολύ άρρωστα από αυτούς που χειρουργούμε στον εγκέφαρο και ενήλικες και παιδιά δεν πάνε στην ομάδα εντατικής θεραπείας και ξυπνάνε αμέσω μετά το χειρουργείο, χωρίς είδημα εγκεφάλου, πράγμα το οποίο επιβεβαιώνεται και από την αξιονική και από τη μαγνητική και από τους αρρώσους στη μονάδα πάρα πολύ ξυπνάνε ήρεμα τις αμέσως μετεγχειρητικές ώρες ε, χωρίς να παρουσιάζει δίδυμα. Νομίζω ότι είναι λάθος να εκτιμάμε, αλλιώς δεν θα πρέπει να κάνουμε χειρουργική του εγκεφάλου. Αν ό,τι ακουμπούσαμε έκανε ήδημα, 
και ο άρρωστο ε, χρειαζόταν οπωσδήποτε να μην επιμακρύνουν σε καταστολή. Δεν έπρεπε να χειρουργούμε όγκου εγκεφάλου, δεν έπρεπε να χειρουργούμε αγκιακέ βλάβε εγκεφάλου. Ε, και γι' αυτό πιστεύω ότι θα πρέπει να είμαστε λίγο ε, πιο προσγειωμένοι όλοι μα και οι εντατικολόγοι και οι νευροχειρουργοί στο πώ αντιμετωπίζουμε τον διασυλληνωμένο ασθενή. Ευχαριστώ για τον χρόνο. Ευχαριστούμε, Κώστα.